this is IBM Museum. On this video, I'm in front of a PS2 Mall 30 286, just to show a little bit of the layout of the planers that can be put in these units. And that's also for the Mall 25 286, because those units share the same planer. I have the system powered off right now, but I'm gonna get turned around. I don't have to worry about a, a my corded microphone in this instance or wearing a headset because I've got some new equipment that I'm putting into the mix. I tried to come up with this video yesterday and I just didn't like how it ended up. So I'm going through and pulling the, the riser and the support just to show pretty much all the planer. My, my webcam covers the square in that upper right hand corner and there's the, there's the diskette drive and hard drive that are, that are out of view in this instance as, as well as the uh, power supply. Now this is a what's ca called the type one planer generally meaning that that was the first planer that IBM released for a model. And the planer is notable in that it has a 40 pin EEPROM chip for the, for the BIOS. And the video memory is soldered onto the planer. And this is VGA, um, so that's the um, 256 kilobyte of VRAM. And often at times on these units, you'll see just these some of the sugar cube, what's called the sugar cube memory, that is in particular sockets, and then the the later uh, dip sims, and these are 30 pin sim sims, of course. But the the sims are marked for installation in a in a particular socket on the on these units, since they they face different ways with the sugar cube chips, and that's just IBM's idea of getting rid of the old stock chips that they had on some other models um, by, by putting in place on these units. Now, I have a, a Type 2 planer as well. And you can ignore the, the Kingston upgrade CPU module that's on there. But the Type 2 is is notable for having two different EEPROM sockets, an odd and an even, and having these boards for the video memory that are that are soldered in. But otherwise, most all of the chip component locations are are the same. It's the same general layout with SIMs and power connections. And then you have the, as I say, this planer can be on the model 2526 that um, has the, the video header that's, that's built in. This board actually looks a little bit, um, one of the pins is out of position in that socket, and you'll the sharp eyed have probably noticed that there's a, there's a great deal of corrosion that's up in this area, and this planer I'll have to get on a, a corrosion cleaning exercise, but it's all in this general location, and I don't know what has necessarily leaked. I don't know if it's either of these. It might be the, some of these capacitors, possibly. Um, 
but I do have uh, the, the VGA chip that's there. And this is the standard uh, 15F um, 6864 VGA chip that IBM put on some of the planers. And it looks like there's even a little bit of corrosion on the corner of those pins. And this might even be, if this, if this um, planer is a loss, it might even be worthwhile to, to pull that chip and delit it. And tube time, I'm, I'm looking at you. I have a, a supply for that, that chip that we can delid. And that has the Seco Epson logo on it. And it'd be interesting to see, since it also is marked with the IBM, that it'd be interesting to see what is under the cover of that chip. Now these, the Type 1 and Type 2 planers are functionally equivalent of each other. I haven't really measured one against the other just to see if there's a better performance or not. Um, I don't know really the reason why IBM changed between the, the two types. This has got to be an early type one with some of the bodge wires and, and things that are there. Um, the, I haven't looked, it'd be underneath the, the drive cage of whether this has a plastic ram deck or the ceramic ram deck like is on the the type 2 planer here and IBM typically when they had designs early on they would have the ceramic ram deck and then they would later on they would shift to a, a plastic version of that ram deck and that's just the the digital to analog converter is what that DAC portion means uh, DAC digital analog converter. Now this video I, I intended to go through and talk about the socket for the the 287 floating point unit. And I do have a few chips here that I can that I can go through and show. And I may have to go through and put my my glasses on as well but these let's go through the the speed rate we've got at the bottom here and this is kind of the the relevant chip that I want to get talking about on this video and it's a uh, the the D80287-10 and then this is a, a also a comparable chip of, of at 10 megahertz as well I've got the wire here and I'll, I'll get covering that aspect here in a moment. And then at the very top, I've got the I287XL. And this is when Intel reworked the 387 core and they, they put that 387 core within this chip as a, as a high performance 287 class FPU. So the reason that those have the speed markings, besides some of these are going to be for the the IBM AT or IBM XT286 units that were preceded the PS2s, because those units, just like the 
Mall 2526 and Mall 3026, they run that the 287 CPU that's in this socket at two thirds of the frequency that the CPU runs at. So this is a 10 megahertz 286, and it runs the 287 processor that's in here, the standard 287, at 6.66 megahertz. And it wasn't until IBM had the microchannel units, and there's also the industrial level system that was based on a um, called the 72 uh, 7562 and that's the called the gearbox that had a, a 286 CPU and it also ran the the 287 at the full 10 megahertz the model the the microchannel models of the 50 the 50z and the mall 60 also run that 287 at the the full speed that the C, the 286 CPU runs at. So I have the system set up. We're going to go ahead and and power it on. I'll go over the benchmark that we're going to use and and go through and we'll we'll check a couple of these chips in the system. So let me get Adjusting things here. Okay, we'll get the unit powered on. Okay. Okay, let me get my screen adjusted a little bit here. I don't know why I had it so far left. Okay. So we get that on the screen. But the benchmark I have set up on, on this system, and accidentally press the enter key, so we got another line feed here, is the landmark 6.0. And I have a little batch file set up to run the program. That goes through where it doesn't display the initial video and it and it, it doesn't it's in quiet mode and doesn't do an initial splash screen. And I want to go through and adjust this for the best okay. And this is probably the best possible way to show it. Now, the landmark utility, it's, it's just a little bit odd. I mean, for the 286 level of CPU, it's about the best you're going to get for really testing these basics of the CPU, the FPU, and the video performance. And it's also unusual that it goes through and it shows the system under test as what it would be, what a, an IBM AT would have to run at to be comparable to the system under test. So this is a model 3026 that runs at the CPU clock, as we can see up there, is at the 10 megahertz. But it's saying an, an IBM AT would have to operate at 11 megahertz or 11.25 megahertz to have the same performance as the system. So it's just a little bit you have to bend your your head around it a little bit to to see how it's doing things, and it's a good comparison. I mean, this will be a good comparison benchmark since it does 
um, covered the 286 level to for some of the like that Intel snap in board, the CPU re replacement that's a 386SX 20 megahertz, and then the, the Kingston modules being at 20 and 25 and 33 megahertz just to see how they test out relatively to to each other because both most of the benchmarks even the DOS, the dos benchmarks out there they look for the minimum of a 386 cpu a lot of the time the common ones like speed sys or some of the other ones um I think CPU check goes through and they just want a, a 386 level CPU as a comparison. There's not too many of these 286 is still in service or are people testing the, the benchmarks of that stuff um, within recent years. And the other unusual thing about the landmark is that that FPU megahertz rating is not scaled the same as the the CPU is. And you can see on the chart here, even though I've adjusted the graph and, and kind of expanded it for how the system is running, it begins that CPU marking at two megahertz. Not, it's not zero based, a zero based scale. And then the FPU scale below it starts at two and it, you know, roughly correlates to like 21 megahertz where at the 11 megahertz that we're at right now the, that the system is testing at. So we just see a little bit of those oddies of the, of the landmark test. It will just have to deal with them. But I want to go through and I'll get switched over on the, the camera and I can go through and put a, a, one of those D8287 chips in place and we can see how it benchmarks under the landmark test. So I'll be right back with you as I go through and get the, the, the camera in that view. Okay, I'm gonna get turned around and power the system down. I'm going to get the D80287-10 to put in here just because I, you know, I'm if I were a novice and not understand what 287 that this would need, I would th I'd look at that 10 megahertz rating on the CPU and think that it would need a comparable FPU. So we've got that installed that quick. I'm gonna insert the, the reference or the excuse me, the starter diskette. This is a PS2 model that's below 50. So it's a starter diskette. And let's get okay, and since we've added the the 287, it's it detects an equipment change and so it wants to go through and run that starter diskette. And it doesn't identify what has changed on the system. Just ask if it be okay to automatically configure the system and do Y for yes. Okay. And the system completes that very quickly. I'm going to press enter key eject the starter diskette and it counts to just that megabyte of RAM very quickly And so let's go through and 
run the Lambert test once again. Okay. And we're going to change the scale again to that where it's got more granularity to the do the scale showing from 2 to 25 megahertz on for the CPU scale. So we can see that the the CPU is operating at that same frequency it classifies that there's um, you know that uh, an IBM AT would have to be operating at 11.2425 megahertz to compare with the system and under the FPU scale of that FPU that's detecting Intel 80287 operating at that 7.12 megahertz that's comparable to two-thirds of the CPU frequency. So we see on the MUL 3286 and it's also for the MUL 2526 that that basic 80287 FPU is going to operate at two-thirds of the frequency of the CPU. And you could you know, back in the day, you could, the FPUs were a little bit more expensive. You know, you, it, it took more money to, to buy a 10 megahertz um, 27 FPU than it took for a, a slower speed. So that's a little bit of this um, for the, for part of this explanation of why IBM did it this way. But, um, you know, they want those microchannel systems to be the top performers. They didn't want the ISA models undercutting the microchannel models. That was IBM's bread and butter for that time at the, of the PS2s. And there's, there's a, a difference there. And of course, the MOL 50 or 50Z or MOL 60 costed a lot more than uh, a PS2 MOL 3286. So there's the a little bit of the the system operating with that 287 CPU. I want to get also this up on the screen because I did have that one 287 FPU and I can pull up on camera view. I went through and tried to modify it to, just to see if I could get it running faster than than two thirds of the CPU frequency, and even here, I'd like to bring up the this is the. the data sheet on that 287 FPU. And or as Intel has identified here, numeric processing extension, MPE. I've never really seen it under that acronym. But on page 11, there's a little bit of text that I'd like to show. And I'm looking at a smaller view. I think I need to keep scrolling. Okay, I think this is, and I can go through and read the part that I was that I was looking at before. So the M eight zero two eight seven can operate either directly from the CPU clock or with a dedicated clock. For operation with the CPU clock, and that they mark it as CKM or clock mode equals zero. Now the clock mode pin is, is pin 39 in that diagram to the, to the right. 
just listed right or shown right underneath me. And what they mean by CKM equal to zero is if that's tied to ground or the VSS voltage, then, and that's what signifies ground in that diagram as well for like pin 30 is ground, VSS is ground. Then the, this runs at effectively at two thirds of the, the frequency of that the CPU operates at. And it's a little bit confusing in that when they talk about the, the system clock in this, there, you know, it, it operates, it works at one third of the frequency of the system clock. The system clock is actually twice the CPU frequency for a 286. So there is a 20 megahertz crystal that's on that planar to operate the, the 286 CPU at 10 megahertz. And so when they say a third of the system clock for the FPU, they're meaning that 6.66 megahertz. That's effectively a, a third of the 20 megahertz system clock. And then continuing on, and I'm on that, it's the third paragraph over on the left-hand column is where I'm reading from, if nobody else has figured it out. This M80287 provides a capability to internally divide the CPU clock by three to produce the required internal clock, 33% duty cycle. To use a higher performance M80287, and they have in parentheses 8 megahertz, and M8, okay, M8254A clock driver, an appropriate crystal may be used to directly drive the M80287 with a one-third duty cycle clock on the clock input and they're saying clock that clock mode or CKM pin equal one and they're saying when pin 39 is tied to the VCC voltage and that's five volts in this instance of the 287 chip that it runs with in in that clock mode and I tried, I'm going to go through and let me change the screen around again. Okay, and I'll get turned around. I did try playing with, and I, what I did is I, I took the pin 39 and splayed it out from the rest of the pins. And that's mostly because I couldn't, on the, the socket for the, for the 287, it is probably connected to the, to the ground plane of the, of the PCB. There's not really any trace, there wouldn't be an ability to go through and effectively disconnect that pin of the socket from the ground level. And so I did a little bridge wire with my wire wrap wire and I went to in in this instance this is this is saying up the FPU in the same way that it's run from the socket anyway because that wire wrap goes to pin 10 which is also ground. And I did that, I was experimenting around because I tried to go to pin nine, which is the VCC voltage at five volts, or tie the pin, I wanted to tie pin 39 high, and that wire doesn't have to be thick because it's not really put, it's just a sense pin. It senses whether it's tied low or tied high for that clock mode. And when I 
when I tied it into to pin 9 for the 5 volts to try and tie it high, it, it just doesn't run. In fact, the landmark benchmark utility doesn't even start up under those conditions. So I was thinking it would be just a simple video that I could that I could go through and I could modify the 287 very quickly, but I've got to trace out a little bit more of how they have the the clock input and that is that pin 32. Got it going through there's there's quite a few no connects as you'll see from the diagram at the at the uh, the top of that diagram pins one through four and then 37 38 uh, it's gonna be thir yeah 37 38 and 40 are no connect and then that clock mode being one of the signals that or one of the pins there that's actually used of that set but I've looked on the the planer and the for the the clock signal it is they even have it tied to some of the the no connect it's really just kind of unusual in that and how they have that that pin connected so I'll have to see how it's sourced they do have a um, it's ultimately that trace is run for the clock is run over to um, one of these chips in the chipset close to the oscillator and they probably have one of these as a, a divider for coming up with that frequency so I'm just gonna see how I could how I have to modify things otherwise in that but what I'd like to do now is we're going to go through and we're going to power down the unit and I will put in the Intel i27XL and if you can find these and they're not I mean I think they're still available out there not much more expensive than what it'd take to to buy the 287 CPU, I mean uh, MPU. But this, as we'll see under the landmark test, and nice little gold pins, back to being a that gold cap and it's a thinner ceramic pack than that earlier 80287. Okay, we've got that seated. We will power things up. And let me get the picture shifted over. Okay, and it didn't want to run through the starter diskette because there wasn't any change. We just substituted one FPU for the other one. And so I'm gonna run my landmark batch file okay and let's change the scale again to show up a little bit better And so the CPU, of course, is operating at the same frequency. It'd be an IBM AT running at 11.2425 megahertz to have an equivalent to this MOL 30 
Droid 6 but the FPU, the Lamart 6O, and this could be off. It's not really accurate otherwise, although that 287 XL has an optimized, that optimized 387 core. It shows the FPU is operating at 16.38 megahertz, so even faster than what the CPU is operating as. And in the FPU type, it has identified as an Intel 802C87. And it, ha it has its C in there different than what the 80287 10 megahertz showed up as. And it's, this is probably just how it marks it with that, that faster core, that CMOS is what the C stands for core is um, it, it's just a little bit more optimized so there's not any adjustments that normally has to be done for the i287XL putting on a, a planer like that it runs at a faster speed and I had the data sheet for it around I'll have to look and see how that comparison is or what you know the how it's clocked and it'd be interesting to even put it on a, a mall 50 or 50z or mall 60 to see how it shows up under the same landmark test and i'll do the the benchmark of those units um i just thought this is going to be a simple video i struggled with it last night to get to where I, I wanted and just didn't I just ran into a roadblock so I thought I'd reproduce it and it's nice that a, a little bit of the, the new channel items the the way I do video capture and can have the lapel mic you know this is the first video that has those components and just displays a little bit better doesn't put me on that leash I have to worry about uh the static just discharge uh, ruining my microphone or anything like that but um, that's you know what I use for for producing this video today so if you've thought that this is a, an informative video click on that like button and by all means subscribe to my channel if you have not already but that is all I have for now. This is IBM Museum. Thank you.